Golding here for another chapter of Lord of the Flies. We're going to get into chapter 7 today. Before we get started with chapter 7, I'd like to talk a little bit about some concepts, some themes that I'm attempting to develop, especially about the beast. We talked about in uh, chapter 5, the beast was introduced yet again from one of the earlier chapters, especially uh, Chapter 2, for example, the boy with the mulberry birthmark on his face brought up the idea of a beastie. And then in chapter 5, uh, several other children discuss their sightings of a beast. We learn that Simon is the one that is gallivanting in the forest at night. Ralph takes a lot of anger out on Simon, especially at the end of chapter 5. And then in chapter 6, we know that uh, there is a beast-like creature that's introduced into the story. We know that it's a dead man in a parachute. The twins, Sam and Eric, see this uh, as the sun begins to come up. It's very dark. The sun is just barely starting to rise, and they see from the fire a figure out in the distance, a, a parachute that's flapping in the wind. And they think it's a beast. They report to the others. And this idea, this theme that I want to speak of is the dark. I keep referring to some of these major events that happen, that it happens as the sun begins to set. Chapter 5, Ralph gives his speech as the sun begins to set. Uh, the opening of chapter 6 discusses the battle in the sky, miles above the boys, miles above the island, and it happens in the dark. Sam and Eric see... Uh, this parachute, this dead man in a parachute in the dock. Uh, but in the light of the day, the, you, they would see things as they really are. And children, we know, some of them are afraid of the dock. Most of them actually are afraid of the dock. Piggy brings this up at the end of chapter 6. He says, adults aren't afraid of the dock. That adults would sit around and talk. They wouldn't fight. They wouldn't have quarrels. Well, is that really true? And in the light of the day, we see things as they really are. If Sam and Eric would have seen the dead man in the parachute in the light of the day, they would have easily recognized what the dead man in the parachute really was. He wasn't a beast, he wasn't harmful. He was just dead. And yes, that would be disturbing to see, but it's not something that would be after you. As Sam and Eric claims. And then we're going to see that as the night begins to fall in chapter 7, we're going to have another sighting of the beast. So just giving you some preparation for this particular huge moment in the chapter. Chapter 7, Shadows and Tall Trees. The pig run kept close to the jumble of rocks that lay down by the water on the other side, and Ralph was content to follow Jack along it. If you could shut your ears to the slow suck down of the sea and the boil of the return, if you could forget how done and unvisited, where the ferny covets on the other side, then there was a chance that you might put the beast out of your mind and dream for a while. The sun had swung over the vertical and the afternoon heat was closing in on the island. Ralph passed a message forward to Jack, and when they came to the next fruit, the whole party stopped and ate. Sitting, Ralph was aware of the heat, and for the first time of the day, he pulled distastefully at his grey shirt and wondered whether he might undertake the adventure of washing it. Sitting under what seemed an unusual heat even for this island, Ralph planned his toilet. He would like to have a pair of scissors and cut his hair. 
He flung the mess back, cut this filthy hair right back to half an inch. He would like to have a bath, a proper wallow with soap. He passed his tongue experimentally over his teeth and decided that a toothbrush would come in handy too. And then there were his nails. Ralph turned his hand over to examine them. They were bitten down to the quick. And though he could not remember when he had restarted this habit, nor any time when he indulged in it. Be sucking my thumb next. He looked around furtively. Apparently no one had heard. The hunters sat, stuffing themselves with this easy meal, trying to convince themselves that they had got a sufficient kick out of bananas, and that the other olive-gray, jelly-like fruit. With the memory of sometimes clean self as a standard, Ralph looked them over. They were dirty. Not with the spectacular dirt of boys who had fallen in the mud and been brought down in a hard, rainy day. Not one of them was an obvious subject for a shower, and yet, hair much too long, tangled here and there, nodded round the dead leaf or twig, faces cleaned fairly well by the process of eating and sweating, but marked in the less accessible angles with a kind of shadow, clothes worn away, stiff like his own with sweat, put on not for decorum or comfort, but out of custom, the skin of the body, scruffy with brine. He discovered with a little fall of the heart that these were the conditions he took as normal now, and that he did not mind. He sighed and pushed away the stalk from which he had stripped fruit. Already the hunters were stealing away to do their business in the woods or down by the rocks. He turned to look out to the sea. Here on the other side of the island, the view was utterly different. The filmy enchantments of the mirage could not endure the cold ocean water, and the horizon was hard and clipped blue. Ralph wandered down by the rocks. Down here, almost on the level with the sea, you could follow with your eye a ceaseless, bulging passage of deep sea waves. They were miles wide, apparently not breakers or banked ridges of shallow water. They traveled the length of the island with an air of disregarding it and being on the other, Business, they were less a progress than momentum of the rise and fall of the whole ocean. And now the sea would suck down, making cascades and waterfalls and retreating water, would sink past the rocks and plaster down the seaweed like shining hair, and then pausing, gather, and rise with a roar, irresistibly swelling over a point in an outcrop, climbing the little cliff, sending at last an arm of the surf up the galley, to the end of the yard, so far from him in fingers of spray. Wave after wave, Ralph followed the rise and fall, until something of the remoteness of the sea numbed his brain. And then gradually, the almost infinite size of this water forced himself to his attention. This was the divider, the barrier. On the other side of the island, swathed the midday with mirage, Defended by this shield of the quiet lagoon, one might dream of rescue. But here, faced by the brute obtuseness of the ocean, the miles of division, one was clamped down, one was helpless, one was condemned, one was... Simon was speaking almost in his ear. Ralph found that he had a rock painfully gripped in both hands and found his body arched, and the muscles of his neck stiff, and his mouth strained open. You'll get back to where you came from. Simon nodded as he spoke. He was kneeling on one knee, looking down from a higher rock, which he held with both hands. His other leg stretched down to Ralph's level. Ralph was puzzled, and searched Simon's face for a clue. It it's so big! I mean, Simon nodded, all the same, you'll get back all right, I think so anyway. Some of the strain had gone from Ralph's body and he glanced at the sea and then smiled bitterly at Simon. You got a ship in your pocket? Simon grinned and shook his head. Well, how do you know then? 
When Simon was still silent, Ralph said curtly, You're batty. Simon shook his head violently till the coarse black hair flew backwards and forwards across his face. No, I'm not. I just think you'll get back all right. For a moment, nothing more was said, and then they suddenly smiled at each other. Roger called from the coverts. Come and see! The ground was turned over near the pig run, and there were droppings that steamed. Jack bent down to them as though he loved them. Ralph, we need meat even if we are hunting the other thing. If you mean going the right way, we'll hunt. And they set off again, and the hunters bunched a little by fear of the mentioned beast while Jack quested ahead. They went more slowly than Ralph had bargained for, and yet, in a way, he was glad to loiter, cradling his spear. Jack came up on some urgency of his craft, and soon the procession stopped. Ralph leaned against a tree, and at once daydreams came swarming up. Jack was in charge of the hunt, and there would be time to get to the mountain. Once following his father from Chatham to Devonport, they had lived in a cottage on the edge of the moors. In the succession of houses that Ralph had known, this one stood out with particular clarity, because after that house, he had been sent away to school. Mummy had still been with them, and Daddy had come home every day. Wild ponies came to the stone wall at the bottom of the garden, and it had snowed. Just behind the cottage, there was a sort of shed, and you could lie up there, watching the flakes swirl past. You could see the damp spot where each flake died, and you could mark the first flake, and lay down without melting and watch, and the whole ground turned white. You could go indoors when you were cold, and looking out the window past the copper kettle and the plate with the little blue men. And when you went to bed, there was a bowl of cornflakes with sugar and cream, and the books. They stood on the shelf by the bed, leaning together with always two or three laid flat on top because he had not bothered to put them away back properly. They were dog-eared and scratched, and there was the bright, shining one about Topsy and Mopsy that he had never read because it was about two girls. There was one about the magician, which you read with a kind of tied-down terror, skipping the page 27 with an awful picture of the spider. And there was a book about the people who dug things up, Egyptian things. And there was the boy's book of trains, the boy's book of ships. Vividly they came before him, and he could have reached up and touched them. He could feel the weight and slow slide with which the mammoth book for boys would come out and slither down. Everything was all right. Everything was good-humored and friendly. The bushes crashed ahead of them. Boys flung themselves wildly from the pig track and scrambled with creepers, screaming, Ralph saw Jack nudged aside and fall, and then there was a creature bounding along the pig track toward him with tusks gleaming and intimidating grunts. Ralph found and he was able to measure the distance coldly and take aim, and with the boar only five yards away, he flung the foolish wooden stick that he had carried. He saw it hit the great snout, then hang there for a moment. The boar's knot changed to a squeal, and it swerved aside into the covert. The pig run filled with shouting boys again, and Ralph came back and poked about the undergrowth. Through there! But he'll do us! Through here, I said! And the boar was floundering away from them, and they found another pig run parallel to the first, and Jack raced away, Ralph full of fright and apprehension and pride. I hit him! The spear stuck in! And now they came, unexpectedly to an open space, by the sea, and Jack cast about the bare rock and looked anxious. He's gone! I hit him, said Ralph again, and the spear stuck in a bit. He felt the need for a witness. Didn't you see me? Morris nodded. I saw you, right bang on the snout. Whee! Ralph talked on excitedly. I hit him all right, and the spear stuck in. I wounded him. He stunned himself in the new respect and felt that hunting was good after all. I walloped him properly. That was the beast, I think. Jack came back. That wasn't the beast. That was a boar. Well, I hit him. Well, why didn't you grab him? 
I tried. Ralph's voice rang up. But a bull! Jack flushed suddenly. You said he'd do us. What did you want to throw for? Why did you wait? He held his... You said he'd do us. What did you want to throw for? Why didn't you wait? He held out his arm. Look! He turned in his left forearm for all to see. On the outside was a rip. Not much, but bloody. He did this with his tusks. I couldn't get my spear down in time. Attention focused on Jack. Well, that's a wound, said Simon. And, and you ought to suck it, like Berengaria. And Jack sucked. I hit him, Ralph said indignantly. I hit him with my spear. I wounded him. He tried for their attention. He was coming along the path, and I threw like this. Robert snarled at him. Ralph entered the play, and everybody laughed, and presently they were all jabbing at Robert, who made mock rushes, and Jack shouted, Make a ring! And the circle moved in and round, and Robert squealed in mock terror, and then in real pain. How? Stop it! You're hurting! The bet end of a spear fell on his back, and he blundered among them. Hold him! They got his arms and legs, and Ralph, carried away by the sudden thick of excitement, grabbed Eric's spear and jabbed at Robert with it. Kill him! Kill him! All at once, Robert was screaming and struggling with the strength of frenzy. Jack had him by the hair and was brandishing his knife. Behind him, Roger, fighting to get close, the chant rose ritually as the last moment of the dance or the hunt. Kill the pig! Cut his throat! Kill the pig! Bash him in! Ralph, too, was fighting to get near, to get a handful of that brown, vulnerable flesh. And then the desire to squeeze and hurt was overmastering, and Jack's arm came down, and the heaving circle cheered and made pig-dying noises. And then they lay quiet, panting, listening to Robert's frightened snivels. And he wiped his face with a dirty arm and made an effort to retrieve his status. Oh, my bum! And he rubbed his rump ruefully. And Jack rolled over. So, look at this scene. They fail in catching the wild boar. And instead, they cheer themselves up by pretending to kill Robert. And they entertain themselves. And they take the butt end of their spears and they begin to jab at Robert, pretending to stab him. Even Jack gets into the action and pulls out his knife and pretends to slit his throat. And they all think that this is funny. And remember when I said that the circle around the boys, the protection of adults and rules and authority, is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller as Roger throws rocks at uh, Percival uh, or begins to kick sand in Percival's face or uh, throws rocks at Johnny. And when we see this, the, the circle of protection gets smaller and smaller. Just as in this case, the boys are entertained by harming each other, by pretending to kill each other. This is a game. So hunting and killing is a game to them now. Kind of similar in today's society that with the advent of, in your current times, video games that allow you to pretend to hunt and kill and shoot each other. It's kind of reducing your circle as well. So keep that in mind as we continue on with this chapter. Well, that was a good game. It's just a game, said Ralph uneasily. I got jolly badly hurt at Rugger once. We ought to have a drum, said Morris. Then we could do it properly. Ralph looked at him. How properly? I don't know. You want a fire, I think, in a drum, and you keep time to the drum. 
You want a pig, said Raja, like a real hunt. Or someone to pretend, said Jack. You could get someone to dress up as a pig, and then they could act, you know, pretend to knock me over and all that. You want a real pig, said Robert, still caressing his rump, because you've got to kill him. Use a litlin, said Jack, and everybody laughed. Then Ralph sat up. Well, we shan't find what we're looking for at this rate. One by one they stood up, twitching rags into place. Ralph looked at Jack. Now for the mountain. Well, shouldn't we go back to Piggy, said Morris, before dark? Twins nodded like one boy. Yes, that's right. Let's go up there in the morning. Ralph looked out at the sea. We got to start the fire again. Well, you haven't got Piggy's speck, said Jack, so you can't. Then we'll find out if the mountain's clear. Morris spoke, hesitating, not wanting to seem a funk. Supposing the beast's up there. Jack brandished his spear. We'll kill it. The sun seemed a little cooler, and he slashed with his spear. Well, what are we waiting for? Well, I suppose, said Ralph, if we keep an eye on the sea by this way, we'll come out below the burnt bit, and then we can climb the mountain. Once more, Jack led them along the suck and heave of the blinding sea. And once more, Ralph dreamed, letting his skillful feet deal with the difficulties of the path. Yet here his feet seemed less skillful than before. For most of the way, they were forced right, down by the bare rock and the water, and the edge along between that and the dark luxuriance of the forest. There were little cliffs to be scaled, and some used to be paths, lengthy traverses. One had to use hands as well as feet, and here and there they had to clamber over wave-wet rock, leaping across clear pools that had the tide had left. Then they came to a gully that split the narrow foreshore like a defense. This seemed to have no bottom, and they peered awe-stricken into the gloomy crack where the water gurgled. And then the wave came back, and the gully boiled before them, and spray dashed up to the very creeper, so the boys were wet and shrieking. They tried the forest, but it was thick and woven like a bird's nest. And in the end, they had to jump one by one, waiting till the water sank. And even so, some of them got a second drenching. And after that, the rocks seemed to be growing impassable. So they sat for a time, letting their rags dry and watching the clipped outlines of the rollers that moved slowly past the island. They found fruit in this haunt of bright little birds that hovered like insects. And then Ralph said that they were going too slowly. He himself climbed a tree and parted the canopy and saw the square head of the mountain seeming still a great way off. And then they tried to hurry along the rocks, and Robert cut his knee quite badly, and then they had to recognize that this path must be taken slowly if they were going to be safe. So they proceeded after that as they were climbing the dangerous mountain until the rocks became the uncompromising cliff, overhung with impossible jungle and falling sheer into the sea. Ralph looked at the sun critically. It's early evening, after tea time, at any rate. I don't remember this cliff, said Jack, crestfalling. So this must be the bit of the coast that I missed. Ralph nodded. Let me think. And by now, Ralph had no self-consciousness in public thinking, but would treat the day's decisions as though he were playing chess. The only trouble was he was never really a very good chess player. He thought of the Litlands and Piggy. Vividly, he imagined Piggy by himself huddled in his shelter that was silent except for the sounds of nightmares. I don't think we should leave Piggy with the Litlands, not all night. The other boys said nothing, but stood round watching him. If we went back, we should take hours. Jack cleared his throat and spoke in a queer, tight voice. We mustn't let anything happen to Piggy, must we? Ralph tapped his teeth with the dry point of Eric's spear. If we go across, he glanced round at him, someone's got to get across the island and tell Piggy that we'll be back after dark. Bill spoke unbelieving. Through the forest? By himself? Now? Well, we can't spare any more than one. Simon pushed his way to Ralph's elbow. I'll go. I don't mind. Honestly.
Think about that. Simon is very comfortable walking in the forest by himself. Before Ralph had time to reply, he smiled quickly, turned and climbed into the forest. Ralph looked back at Jack and seeing him infuriatingly for the first time. Jack, that time you went to the whole way to the castle rock. Jack glowered. Yes? You came along the, this part of the shore, below the mountain, beyond there. Yes. And then? I found a pig run. It went for miles. So the pig run must be somewhere in there. Ralph nodded, and he pointed at the forest. Everybody agreed sagely. All right, then. We'll smash the way until we find the pig run. And he took a step and halted. Wait a minute, though. Where does the pig run go to? The mountain, said Jack. I told you, he sneered. Don't you want to go to the mountain? Ralph sighed, sensing the rising antagonism, understanding that this is how Jack felt, and as soon as he ceased to be the lead. I was thinking of the light. We'd be stumbling about. We were going to look for the beast. There won't be enough light. I don't mind going, said Jack hotly. I'll go when we're there, won't you? Or would you rather go back to the shelters and tell Piggy? And now it was Ralph's turn to flush, and he spoke despairingly out of a new understanding that Piggy had given him. Why do you hate me? The boy stood uneasily, as though something indecent had been said, and the silence lengthened. Ralph, still hot and hurt, turned away first. Well, come on! He led the way and set himself by right to hack at the tangles, and Jack brought up the rear, displacing and brooding. The pig track was a dark tunnel, and for the sun was sliding quickly toward the edge of the world, and the forest shadows were never far to seek. The track was broad and beaten, and they ran along with swift foot. And then the roof of leaves broke up and they halted, breathing quickly, looking up at the few stars that picked round the head of the mountain. So again, night is coming. And Ralph wants to go back to the shelters, but Jack wants to go and see if he can find the beast and kill it. So there's a disagreement here about what to do next. And this adds to the rising action so, uh, what your essential question should be for these notes, uh, what events in this chapter lead to the rising action? He led the way and set himself right to hack at the tangles, and Jack brought up the rear, displaced then brooding. The pig track was a dark tunnel, for the sun was sliding quickly toward the edge of the world, and the forest shadow was never far to seek. The track was broad and beaten, and they ran on long, swift foot. Then the roof of leaves broke up, and they halted, breathing quickly, looking for the few stars that pricked round the head of the mountain. There you are. The boys peered at each other doubtfully. Ralph made a decision. We'll go straight across the platform and climb tomorrow. They murmured in agreement, but Jack was standing by his shoulder. Well, if you're frightened, of course. Ralph turned on him. Who went first to the castle rock? Oh, I went too, and that was daylight. All right. Who wants to climb the mountain now? Silence was the only answer. Sam and Eric, what about you? We ought to go and tell Piggy. Yes, tell Piggy. But Simon went. We ought to tell Piggy just in case. Robert? Bill? They were going straight back to the platform now. Not the course that they were afraid, but they were tired. Ralph turned back to Jack. You see? I'm going up to the mountain. The words came from Jack viciously as though they were a curse. And he looked at Ralph, his thin body tensed and his spear held as if he was threatening him. I'm going up to the mountain to look for the beast now. 
And then the supreme sting, the casual bit of word. Coming! At that word, the other boys forgot their urge, and they were gone, and turned back to the sample fresh rub of the two spirits in the dark. The word was too good, too bitter, too successful, daunting to be repeated. It took Ralph at low water, and then his nerve was relaxed for the return of the shelter and the still friendly waters of the lagoon. Well, I don't mind. Astonished, he heard his voice coming out, cool and casual, so that the bitterness of Jack's taunt fell powerless. Coming? I don't mind. If you don't mind, of course. Not at all. Jack took a step. Well then, and side by side, watched by silent boys, the two started up the mountain. Ralph stopped. We're silly. Why should only two go? If we find anything, two won't be enough. And they came to the sound of boys scuttling away. Astonishingly, a dark figure moved against the tide. Roger? Yes. Well, that's three then. And once more they set out to climb the slope of the mountain. The darkness seemed to flow round them like the tide. Jack, who had said nothing, began to choke and cough. And a gust of wind set all three spluttering. Ralph's eyes were blinded with tears. Ashes were on the edge of the burnt patch. Their footsteps in the occasional breeze were stirring up the small devils of dust. And now they were stopped again. And Ralph had time while he coughed to remember how silly they were. If there was no beast, and almost certainly there was no beast, in that case, well, and good. But if there was something waiting on top of that mountain, what was the use of three of them, handicapped by the darkness and carrying only sticks? We're being fools! Out of the darkness came an answer. Windy? Irritably, Ralph shook himself. This is all Jack's fault. Of course I am, but we're still being fools. If you don't want to go on, I'll go myself. Go on, then. I'll wait here. Why don't you go? Are you frightened? A stain in the darkness, a stain that was Jack, detached itself and began to draw away. All right. So long. And the stain vanished. Another took its place. Ralph felt his knee against something hard, and a rock, a charred trunk that was edgy to the touch. He felt the sharp cinders that had been the bark pushed against the back of his knee, and he knew that Roger sat down, and he felt with his hands and lowered himself beside Roger, and while the trunk rocked among the visible ashes, Roger, uncommunicative by nature, said nothing. He offered no opinion on the beast, nor told Ralph why he had chosen to come on this mad expedition. He simply sat rocked the trunk gently. Ralph noticed a rapid and infuriating tapping noise and realized that Roger was banging his silly wooden stick against something. And so they sat, the rocking, tapping, impervious Roger and Ralph fuming round them close to the sky, loaded with stars, save the mountain punched up by a hole in the blackness. There was a slithering noise high above them, the sound of someone taking giant and dangerous strides on the rock and ash. Then Jack found them, and the shivering and the croaking voice that they could just recognize was his. I saw a thing on top! They heard him blunder against the trunk, which rocked violently, and he lay silent for a moment, and then he muttered, Keep a good lookout! It may be following! shower of ash pattered round them, and Jack sat up. I, I saw a thing bulge on the mountain. You only imagined it, said Ralph shakily, because nothing would bulge, not any sort of creature. Hodges spoke, and they jumped, but they had forgotten him. A frog? Jack giggled and shuddered. Some frog? There was a noise, too, a kind of plop noise, and then the thing bulged. Ralph surprised himself, not much of the quality of his voice, which was even, but by the bravado of his intention. Well, we'll go and look. For the first time he had first known Jack, Ralph could feel him hesitate. Now? 
His voice spoke for him. Of course. He got off the trunk and led the way across the clinking cinders up to the dock, and the others followed. And now that his physical voice was silent, the inner voice of reason, and other voices too, made themselves heard. Piggy was calling him a kid, another voice was telling him not to be a fool, and the darkness and the desperate enterprise gave the night's kind of dentist chair unreality. As they came to the last slope, Jack and Roger drew near, changed from the ink stains to the distinguishable figures, and by common consent they stopped and crouched together. And behind them on the horizon was a patch of lighter sky where in a moment the moon would rise. And then the wind roared once in the forest and pushed the rags against them. Ralph stirred. Come on! They crept forward, Roger lagging a little. Jack and Ralph turned the shoulder of the mountain together. And the glittering lengths of the lagoon lay below them and beyond that, a long white smudge that was the reef. Roger joined them. Jack whispered, Let's keep forward on our hands and knees. Maybe it's asleep. Roger and Ralph moved on, this time leading. Jack in the rear, for all his brave words, and they came to the flat top where the rock was hard to the hands and knees. A creature bulged. Ralph put his hand on the cold, soft ashes of the fire and smothered a cry. His hands and shoulder were twitching from the unlooked for contact. Green lights of nausea appeared for a moment and ate into the darkness, and Roger lay behind him, and Jack's mouth was at his ear. Over there, where there used to be a gap in the rock, a sort of hump. Do you see it? Ashes blew into Ralph's face from the dead fire. He could not see the gap or anything else, because the green lights were opening again and growing, and the top of the mountain was sliding sideways, and once more from a distance he heard Jack's whisper. Scared? Not scared as much as paralyzed, hung up there, immovable on top of the diminishing moving mountain. Jack slid away from him, and Roger bumped, fumbled with a hiss of breath, and he passed onwards, and he heard them whispering. Can you see anything? There. In front of them, only three or four yards away was a rock-like hump where no rock should be. Ralph could hear a tiny chattering noise coming from somewhere, perhaps from his own mouth. And he bound himself together with his will and fused his fear and loathing into a hatred and he stood up and he took two leaden steps forward. And behind them, the silver of a moon had drawn clear of the horizon. And before them, something like a great ape was sitting asleep with its head between its knees. And then the wind roared in the forest. And then there was confusion in the darkness. And the creature lifted his head, holding toward them a ruin of the face. Ralph found himself taking giant strides among the ashes. Heard the creatures crying out and leaping, dared the impossible on the dark slope. And presently, the mountain was deserted save for the three abandoned sticks, the thing that bowed. So, again, we have another beast sighting. Again, it's in the dark light of the moon. The wind animates the parachute. The dead body of the pilot sits up, stares at them, allows some movement, and they think that this is the beast asleep and that they awaken the beast. And before they could really tell what it was, they ran away. And as we continue on with the next chapter, we're going to see these divisions, these disagreements, the fear which is kind of what the beast symbolizes here, this fear against the unknown, this fear of what's going to happen next, this internal fear, fear of each other, fear of the things that is going on in the world outside them, the fear of never being rescued. All these fears are starting to build and build and build until the fear causes them to turn against each other. And you can see this coming to this point. 
And as we start moving forward, we're going to get to the crisis slash climax of this particular story in the next couple chapters.